So good to see new ones out and old ones back. Welcome everyone here. So those who come for a little distance. All of us, no matter how old we are, at least in the West, or how Puritan we now are, as some of us are <laughs> in our current convictions, have memories of Christmas Eve or Christmas morning that have stayed with us over the years. And we cannot help but reflect on family and friends who are no longer with us and on Christmas past in our lives. As I look back as an old man and think about the holiday of Christmas, I have a lot of memory, memories that come crowding back, and I'm sure you do as well. My grand grandparents' house was about a block away from our house, and uh, I have a very profound, happy moment uh, cutting down a Christmas tree with my grandfather, dragging it out of the woods, putting him up in his living room. It's the only time I ever did that in my life, I think. I might have did, done it once after we were married, I don't know. But I remember doing it with him. And also remember that Christmas was pretty quiet at my grandparents' house. Uh, they, and they had those bubble lights that the 1950s were famous for. And uh, I enjoyed that. I remember our house in the 50s. Sometimes we'd have real trees and sometimes fake trees. And I didn't care for the fake ones, but we had them. I loved the electric train set that was mine. It was always set up around the tree. And I have one memory, very, I have a couple of memories, very big ones. My brother, Bob, my younger brother, Bob and I got a Prince Valiant cape, sword and shield, each of us for Christmas. And that was a big mistake. <laughs> as soon as we got those things on, you can imagine what happened right after that as boys will be boys, and we had at it, right in front of everybody in front of the tree. I remember lonely Christmases as a single person. Uh, many times I was able to be with family, but sometimes I was not. And uh, I remember those. It seemed especially difficult. So all of you that are single, I understand where you're coming from. Um, I remember boisterous Chris Christmases and over at Linda's dad's father, her father's house in Toledo, um, 20 plus adults there feasting on kielbasa and baked ham, uh, baked in bread surrounding it and wonderful stuff, shrimp appetizers eggnog, and some folks having too much Christmas cheer, but he did have a good, many good times there over the year. But really, really, we would be greatly remiss whether we've had good memories or bad or anything else. And even though the Bible, the Bible never tells us to remember Jesus' birth, it tells us to remember his death, which we're going to remember tonight. Never mentions remembering his birth. But I I thought about what am I going to say tonight in more of an informal kind of Christmas Eve gathering. And I thought, well, what if all of us could transport ourselves back to the first century? To that first time. I'm not talking about Scrooge and the Christmas past in his life, I'm talking about clear back to within 30 years of Jesus' death. And suppose all of us were there and we came in on a, a, a reunion of the apostles from all over the world. They're all there. And we would get to ask them, tell me about the birth of Jesus and what that means to you. We would have that privilege to have that reunion 
With all the apostles still living, of course, James would be gone, but the rest would be there. And ask us to tell him something about the birth of Christ. I wonder how that would go. What, what is especially meaningful to you? And so I, in my own mind, I went back and, Matthew, tell us, what's most meaningful and memorable to you that you want others to know about, about the birth of Jesus? And Matthew would probably say, you got to know his genealogy. You got to know the genealogy of Joseph. That is his right to the king, to the throne of David, his legal right to the throne. And you've got to know that the angel appeared to Joseph and told him about the virgin birth. Got to know that. You have to know about the visit of the wise men and the prophecy of Micah 5.2 and the star that stopped right over Bethlehem, whatever that was, and the gifts that were given. You got to know that. This is important stuff. It all has meanings beyond the original situation. And you know the assassination attempt of the baby Jesus by King Herod the Great. You got to know about that. But to sum it all up, Matthew would say, the one who died for us and rose again is our king. He's the king of Israel, and he's the king of kings. And I was just a tax collector, collecting taxes for Rome, fellowshipping with sinners, and Jesus chose me to be an apostle. And I'll never forget that he's a friend, tax collector, and sick. I suppose he'd say something like that. And we'd say, well, John Mark, what do you got? <clears throat> and John Mark would say, well, I don't have as much as Matthew's got. I didn't even write about his birth. <clears throat> I started my gospel with his baptism. But Peter told me something I never forgot when I was writing the gospel of Mark. In fact, it impressed me so much, I made it the focal point of my whole gospel and it's this, Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to serve, to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. You see, I know why he came. He came to serve. He came to give his life a ransom for many. And that one verse is a focal point for every all 16 chapters of my gospel. And it's it's what all of that means to me. Jesus is God's servant and our redeemer. And I wasn't a very good servant. I turned back and left Paul and Barnabas. I was a servant that failed, but Jesus is a servant who didn't fail. He succeeded in doing what God called him to do. Well, thank you, Mark. All right, Dr. Luke, you're not an apostle. You're a second-generation Christian, but you knew a lot of people that were there, and you interviewed dozens of people who wrote or spoke on those things. What do you think about Chris? And Luke would say, well, you got to know about the appearance of the angel, Mother Mary, to tell her everything that was happening before it happened. You're going to conceive. You're going to have a baby. You've got to understand the virgin birth. You've got to understand Mary's Magnificat and the music that was in her soul and not just the child that was in her belly. You've got to hear the angels' hymns of heaven that the shepherds heard. 
You've got to get the music of redemption. You've got to know what worship is on the basis of who Jesus is and what he has done. That would be something I would say is important. Thank you, Dr. Luke. John, what do you have? Oh, I have many things. I wrote five books of the New Testament. It take too long for me to say everything. But the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And if people don't believe Jesus came in the flesh, they are demon-possessed and, de and, and satanic. Those that believe he came in the flesh have God. Those that don't believe that don't have God. No matter how religious they are, no matter how intelligent they are. Read my epistle, and you'll know that. And on a personal note, John would say, I had such a temper that John, Jesus named my brother and I sons of thunder. And he made me the apostle of love. Changed my life. Well, Peter, what do you have to say? <laughs> about the Lord Jesus Christ and the birth of Jesus Christ. And Peter would say, you are not redeemed with perishable things such as silver and gold from your empty manner of life received by tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot who was chosen before the for creation of the world but revealed in this last time for your sake. And Jesus put up with me even when I was so proud as to try to correct him. And even when he had to deal with me so seriously and I denied him. You ask me about Christmas, it's about Mary had a little lamb and his name was Jesus. And that little lamb was the lamb of God to take away my sin and yours. And then we would see James, who wrote the book of James and the brother of our Lord. And Pastor James, what can you add? I can add this. My older brother is God incarnate. And I serve him as I serve God. And you can read that in the first verse of my epistle if you want to. And I call him our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 2, verse 1. Jude, do you have anything to say about Jesus that your brother James has not said? Jude would say, I am the brother of James but I'm the servant of my brother Jesus. I serve him and I worship him the way I worship God. And I remember that none of us brothers uh, recognized our older brother as the Messiah. And we tried to give him counsel to go up to Jerusalem and he put us in our place and said, the world can't receive me, but it will receive you, because we were unsaved. And I remember that rebuke. It's found in John's epistle. And I thank him for it, and he forgave us for all our unbelief. Now, after all of that, we might say, is there anybody left here that's got something to say? And an individual would come forward and say, I would like to continue to remain anonymous, but just so you know I, who I am, I wrote the book of Hebrews. And God 
in many ways, in many portions, spoke in times past to our fathers through the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us in his Son. Don't you forget that. And he was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. He didn't take upon himself the nature of angels. He took upon himself the nature of Abraham, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Well, thank you. You want to know, do you want, don't, can't we find out your name? No. <laughs> You're going to have to wait till you get to heaven. And then we come to the Apostle Paul, and Paul was not with Jesus while he was on the earth and persecuted him. But Paul wrote a lot of our New Testament. And we come to Paul, and Paul said, yes, I'll have something to say. I'll keep it very, very brief. And I'll keep it brief because there's one more person after me that should have the last word on all of this. So I'm just going to keep it brief. And I would say this, and everything I say is in your Bibles from letters already written by me. Here's one of them. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the full status as sons. Here's another one. Let your attitude be the same as that of Jesus Christ, who being in the form of God, thought it not, uh, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, and being found in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God's highly exalted him, given him a name above every name, and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Don't ever forget that. Oh, here's something else Paul said. Great is the mystery of God. God was manifest in the flesh. Vindicated by the Spirit, seen of angels, preached on to the nations, believed on in the world and taken up to glory. Don't forget that. And don't forget this, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Christmas is a time for the display of God's grace because without the incarnation, there would be no death and no salvation. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passion and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's a Christmas message for you. Thank you, Paul. That's pretty convicting. Oh, Paul said, I got a couple more. He who was rich became poor, that you through his poverty could become rich. And don't forget this one. It's not in my epistles. It's more blessed to give than receive. And Paul says, I've got nothing more to say, although I want to say more, but I've been long speaking, and I don't want anyone to fall asleep because I remember what happened in Troas to Eutychus. But there's one more person here who should have the last word over all of us. It's the aged Mary the mother of Jesus. She's in her 70s now. And she's still with us. She was with us at Pentecost. She's been with us all these decades. She's stricken with age, but she's here. And Mary would say, I'm getting pretty old and I've forgotten 
lot of things. But there's some things I can never forget that were told me by the angel Gabriel, that were told me when Jesus was conceived, things I heard when he was born. And the reason I never forget them is I treasured them in my heart because I knew this is something for the rest of my life more important than anything else. And this is something other people need to know. Even the hard part when I was told a sword will pierce your own soul, that the hearts of many will be revealed. And I remember the angel Gabriel told me when Jesus was conceived of this baby, he'll be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. He'll reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will have never, no end. I remember that. I remember what the angel, uh, angel Gabriel told my husband, Joseph, that I was with child by the Holy Spirit. That saved my marriage. And I remember he said, you are to give him the name Jesus because he'll save his people from their sins. And I remember what I was told about the prophet Isaiah. You're going to call his name Emmanuel, which is God with us. And that same prophet also wrote 740 years before Jesus was born, Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulder. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Father of Eternity, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government peace, there'll be no end. He'll reign on the throne of David forever and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. And the zeal of the Lord host will perform it. Well, thank you, apostles. Thank you, Mary. You didn't tell us anything that wasn't in our Bible, though. Because the scriptures are sufficient. The scriptures we have that have been maintained and have come down to us are everything we need to know. We just need to know it better. We could have saved the time and expense to go back to Christmas past if we just read our Bible. But thank you for reminding it. It's been a great reunion. Now, we can't really go back to the first century. I happen to think that would be, if anybody asked me where I'd like to go in a time machine, it'd be right there. Can't do that. There is no time machine. There is no Christmas past that we can go back to and relook at things. But I don't feel too bad about that because we are going forward. We can't go back, but we can go forward. And when we go forward, there's going to be a selective review of history. You say, what? Yes. When we're going to find out even more. Let me prove what I'm saying here tonight. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. In verse 10. Now, this is the judgment seat of Christ. This is believers only. And believers don't come before this particular judgment. But Paul, writing to Christians, says to them and to us, verse 10, for we must all appear before the Bema seat of Christ. 
And that Bema seat is the same seat that judges would sit on in Corinth. It's the same seat that the Corinthian games, they pass out rewards. We must all, all Christians, appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now watch what happens when we get there. That everyone may receive the things done in his body according to as he's done, whether it be good or evil. Evil, like bad, means worthless. Now, if you just look at this verse, and some of you have heard me teach on this before, there will be a receiving, there will be there will be a reviewing, there will be a receiving. It's very interesting. There's going to be a receiving of the things done in his body, that means in this life, according as he's done, that's a reviewing, and there'll be a rewarding. There's a reviewing, a receiving, and a rewarding. Interesting. And it's either going to be good or worthless. Now, in that reviewing, what's that all about? You can't have a rewarding without a reviewing. Your life and mine at the judgment seat of Christ will be reviewed in some way, selectively. I don't believe sin will be there because that's under the blood. But we do a lot of worthless stuff. But then we do other things. And we are saved to do good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk. Walk in them. Every Christian life has certain things that God has planned for them to accomplish. There'll be a reviewing. Now, your part and mine might be very small in the big realm of things. It might be medium. It might be very great because we don't know in this one. In that reviewing, we're going to find out that the little things that we did for the Lord that our, our little life that seemed fairly insignificant was way more important than we ever imagined. Pick out Boaz and Ruth. Do you think they understood how important their life was? No, they didn't live long enough. Your life and mine in a little town of Athens is the same. And we don't even know if we're doing big things or little because big things hang on little things like the birth of a baby or a decision to sacrifice your life to serve others as Ruth did to Naomi. That reviewing will be interesting because every life, every person saved has a part to play in the great role history. Some think about warfare, and we are invisible warfare. Some soldiers think, I didn't do anything. How do you know that? You don't know. You don't see the big picture. You may have been the one person that saved the other person that did something big. <laughs> that, was your, that was your moment. You just didn't even know it. That's part of what that reviewing will be. And that absolutely, totally amazes me. And every man will be rewarded according to his work, 1 Corinthians 3 says. And it's either gold, silver stones, and silver and precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble. But we, there will be a reward. One of the things that always fascinates me is that Different Christians live different lifespans. You've heard me say this so many times. My roommate in seminary died of a heart attack at 48. I could never get over that. I've been preaching the Bible more years than he lived. And he was a better preacher than me. He accomplished what God wanted him to do. 
heart attack, he's in heaven at 48. Apparently, I'm not ripe yet. <laughs> but it's God that works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. He's got a purpose for everyone's salvation. And that's a fascinating and wonderful thought to think about. So someday I believe that there will be a reviewing. Now, even at the great white throne, there'll be a reviewing. Turn with me to Revelation 20. This is for unsaved people, not for saved people. But we'll be there. Every Christian that was martyred is going to be there when, they're, when the ones who murdered them are being judged. Every Christian that was slandered Every Christian that was mistreated is going to be there. And they can't say they don't do it. They didn't do it because we'll be standing there when they're when the books are opened and their life is reviewed. In Revelation 20, verse 11, and I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And the I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. They didn't say the computer files are open. They didn't okay, that could communicate to anybody. God keeps records. <clears throat> and another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead, that's the unsaved dead, were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Not to determine whether they get in heaven or not, but to determine what degree of punishment they endure for the rest of eternity. And won't that be a moment? Every life reviewed, saved and unsaved. And for us selectively, I don't think God's going to drag all our sins out in front of everybody, but at the great white throne, they're going to be drug out. That ought to be motivation enough to get saved, right? So as we think about this, and we think about uh, the awesome events before us and behind us, there's so much we don't know, but we'll find out then. And we don't have to know it, because we'll find it out then. And there's so much other people don't know. And we don't have to tell them because they'll know it then. Don't waste your life trying to vindicate yourself. That's a dumb thing to do. In Revelation chapter 18 and verse 20, it says of Babylon's fall, rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. What's true of Babylon is true of every other persecutor of God's people. Now we come to the Lord's Supper tonight. And we're coming to remember what Jesus did. Not what we do or don't do, but what he did. Because that's going to be the focus, not what we did, but what he did. And what the Holy Spirit did through, because of him and through us. But we come to the Lord's Supper specifically because our Lord was born to die. And Mary was told, and Joseph was told, name him Jesus, because he's going to save his people from their sin. So name him Jehovah Saved. As we take the cup and we take the bread, as we think of who it was that died and we think of the price that was paid and we do it at the time when people around the world are at least in some way reminded of Jesus's birth, doing their best to avoid it, doing their best to drown any information that is coming their way by being occupied with everything else except what Jesus' birth should occupy us with. All the satanic uh, uh, 
things to divert people's mind. You want to know where a politicians learn how to divert people's minds? It's from the devil himself. He's the master. Look at this. Look over here. But we want our minds focusing on our Lord. We want our minds focused not just on his birth, but on his birth as the one who came to die. That's why we're taking communion tonight. If you're new with us and you know the Lord as your Savior, you're welcome to celebrate the Lord's Supper with us. If you're here and you're not yet saved, we're still glad you're here. And we're going to pass the bread which represents his body broken for us. We're going to pass the cup, which represents his blood shed for us. We're going to take the bread and we're going to take the cup right where we sit. And we're going to do it reflecting on the great work of Jesus. And we don't have to be back that far. We don't even have to be ahead because we can be right where we are because we got the Bible to tell us about it all. Father, help us as we come to the Lord's Supper tonight. Direct our minds, direct our hearts into true worship and adoration and joy. And thank you for the Savior who loved us and gave himself for us. In Jesus' name. we go from this place loving you more trusting you more may the power of your love and the light of your word shine forth to a sin darkened world as we go from this